born in Dunkirk. At the age of six months, my mother died, and my dad uh, was diagnosed with tuberculosis. My dad and me and my older brother all ended up at Newton Memorial Hospital. That's right across the lake from Lilydale up on the hill. It's now called the uh, Job Corps, yeah. And I grew up there. I stayed there until I was 16 years old when I graduated from high school. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. At first I says, the little, little, little guys, those little Japs are picking on us, us big husky guys. I said, we'll clean their clock in a hurry. And little did I realize how efficient and proficient they were at battle. Uh, it was it was more like a exhilaration, I think. It says, hey, we're getting into a <laughs> something big here. Of course, I, that's the way a kid would think, right. especially a young teenager, yeah. a boy. <laughs> as soon as I graduated, I absconded from that place, <laughs> and I landed at my brother's home here in Westfield. I got to know a guy named Darwin Herbst. He was a uh, He was in the Merchant Marine, and he wore the snappiest uniform I ever saw. And I said, gee. But uh, he was not happy in the Merchant Marine. He sailed on tankers, and he immediately joined the Army. He thought it was safer. A uh, little known fact is that uh, the casualty rate for the Merchant Mariners was uh, highest of any service, including the Marines, Army, Navy, Air Force. The casualty rate was higher in the Merchant Marine than any other branch. The Battle of the Atlantic continues. German U-boats running in wolf packs prowl the stretches of the ocean from the great Arctic Circle to the southern route in a desperate Nazi move to prevent American soldiers and supplies from reaching Europe and Africa. Ships have gone down, yes, but not at a rate sufficient to please Hitler. Why was that? Uh, one of the reasons was a stiff-necked Navy uh, admiral in Washington. The British at that time had developed a convoy system to protect their ships. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, destroyers and aircraft carriers and all kinds of methods of protecting their ships. This stiff-necked uh, admiral says, we don't need convoys. And he sent all his ships out to sea solo, no protection. Mm -hmm. And uh, the story was that people along the Florida coast would get out their long ch chairs at dusk and watch the U-boats sink ships as they sailed down the coast of Florida toward the Gulf or the canal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a perfect backdrop. They never turned out the lights uh, uh, on shore, and the ships were just silhouetted beautifully. And the U-boat captains had a glorious time. He sank ship after ship after ship. And it got so bad that President Roosevelt put a gag order on the casualties I think I'd like to join them, which bring wear a uniform like that. Of course, I was just 16 then. In the fall, I hopped on a bus, went up to Buffalo, 
and join the maritime service. Basic training at uh... Sheepshead Bay. Okay. Where that, was that located? I'm not that's, sure. Sheepshead Bay is located basically in Brooklyn. Marine Basic was pretty tough too. Mm -hmm. The two things that I remember most about the basic training part, uh, one of them was survival in case you were on a tanker and it was sunk. Mm -hmm. The oil slick would spread out over the water and catch on fire and we had to jump off a platform into a, a big pool of blazing oil slicked water hmm. with a life jacket and survive. Wow. I never did anything like that when I was in the Army <laughs> to basic training. The other thing they had, they had the, uh, the most amazing gunnery uh, training program. It was like a big auditorium and they had uh, 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns and 50 calibers. And they had a big 3D screen. You had to wear glasses. The airplanes would come buzzing across this way and that way, all different directions, and you had to shoot them down with your anti-aircraft gun, and you had tracers to see where your bullets were going, or your, and it, that was fun. <laughs> During the latter part of the basic training, they were going to send me to sea as a mess boy, and I didn't like that. They didn't have the snappy uniforms. <laughs> Found a note on my bunk is uh, looking for applicants to try out to see if they could hack the radio school. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, I jumped at the chance. I was accepted. And the radio school was a highly accelerated uh, program where you did about a year and a half's work in, in about two, three months. We worked, we went to school morning, noon, and night. Seven days a week. Highly accelerated program because they were desperately in need of radio operators at that time, qualified ones. And, uh, well, describe it. Describe if I, as you're describing to your daughter, what did that all mean, becoming a radio operator? Well, you became an officer. Okay. You graduated from radio school with a warrant radio electrician, which is a warrant officer. It's a blue, gold, blue, gold stripe mm -hmm. and a nice uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm seeing a theme here. Strictly marine radio, the okay. the radio uh, stations ab aboard ship, ah. and your basically your receivers. You had an emergency transmitter, a high frequency transmitter, and a regular. Low, uh, low frequency transmitter. We learned all the procedures, distress, how to contact uh, medical facilities, uh, how to send routine telegrams. We received news and put out a newspaper. <laughs> really? Yeah. Armed Forces Radio uh, we, we typed up a, a paper every day got the latest war news and everything we uh, got our weather reports and 
and uh, we operated uh, a radio direction finder. A case uh, we ran into another ship that was sinking or something, we could tune in on their radio signals and get a, a bearing to, to them and find them. As soon as I got to San Francisco, I reported to the Union Hall and they assigned you to a ship. That was to John Isaacson. A good Swede, yeah. One of the duties of the radio officer was to attend the master and his, I guess it was the chief mate. We all went to a conference to the local naval headquarters or, and so forth. And at that time, we were briefed on where our destination was. The rest of the crew did not know. The first sign of any enemy activity that I saw was a couple of floating mines sitting out in the middle of the Pacific, bob bobbling around. Mm -hmm. We. Uh, How did you even see me? I mean, at some point. They're floating around, but somebody's got a, you know, you're gonna, you're in a big boat, and uh, you know, how does one spot those things? They, they float. Okay. They they were bobbing up and down like a, like a big big uh, beach ball, you know. Yeah, right. And uh, we decided to have the gunnery. We we had a, a naval contingent aboard called. Uh, oh, Navy, pe Navy people yep. to man the guns. We were qualified to help man the guns, but we didn't actually use them unless the Navy got killed or something. They they used the uh, twenty miller twenty millimeter anti aircraft guns and and shot those mines full of holes. Didn't explode them just breached a hole so that the what they fill with water and sank. They sank. Oh my god, that's interesting. Then comes the fun part, crossing the equator. We had some amazing people aboard that ship. They set up a court. They call it King Neptune's Court. He had a throne, he had long whiskers, he had a crown, and there's Davy Jones and his whole retinue of people set up there like a court of law. And uh, all of us, uh, what do they call us? Trusty Shellback. Well, before we became a Shellback, we had a, we were polywogs or something. All of us who had never crossed the equator before were brought up before the court 
and the prosecutor related its crimes and dealt out his punishment. I don't think his name was Greg Peterson, but... Uh, Close, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was dragged up before King Neptune and his court, and the prosecutor accused me of masturbating on the high seas. How do you plead? I says, guilty as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so I was made to crawl. They, they had gotten these uh, steel drums, took the ends off, and made a tunnel, filled it with garbage. You had to crawl through that. And uh, they made it stripped down to our, un uh, our underwear. And they went through a paddle line. And they whacked us with uh, paddles. And, and uh, they sat me down in a barber's chair, gave me a shampoo with grease and oil, and then ran the shaver right through the top of my head at a bare spot, here, 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 there. Ugly. <laughs> I love it. And then they were going to make me walk the plank as my punishment. Mm -hmm. They set up a plank over the side of the ship where I could see it. And uh, they tied a line around me, a lifeline. And then they blindfolded me and took me around to number two hatch and out uh, on a plank there. They had arranged, and I was blindfolded. I didn't see any of this. They put me on this plank and pushed me into this huge pool of water and say, oh, we lost the lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm frantically flailing and trying to oh, well. get rid of them, blindfold them, find out what they did. But it was all in fun. At the end of that ordeal, we each got a great big shot of whiskey, which was, <coughs> uh, it's not known, but whiskey is not uh, allowed on merchant marine ships. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the SS John Isaacson. Mm -hmm. Yep, signed by Davy Jones and Neptunus Rex. Fantastic. Our first stop was Hollandia, New Guinea. Mm -hmm. uh, we sat out there in the harbor for, for several days before we were even noticed because of congestion. There's a lot of ships there. But uh, finally, uh, the harbor master and his cohorts came aboard. They were Australian. And our skipper, being gentleman that he was, says, uh, would you gentlemen like some coffee, tea, or cocoa? And this Australian hollered out, cow, 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 the bloody king. Don't even get kill kill. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I'll never forget that. The bloody king don't even get kill kill. <laughs> June sixth, I believe, uh, forty-five. What was the reaction on the your ship on that? Oh, they went wild. I I put. Of course, I was writing the newspaper, and that was my headline. Typhoon, yeah, oh, that was a wild one. We got tossed around a bit, but uh, we... Liberty was a pretty tough ship. Steaming back into uh, the harbor and seeing that tug sitting up on 
<laughs> up halfway of a month. Well, it is the greatest story never told. On July 30th, 1945, in the final days of World War II, the USS Indianapolis was torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. She sank in 12 minutes here in the deepest part of the Pacific Ocean, somewhere between Guam and the Philippines. The Indianapolis, uh, you probably heard about that. It was a cruiser and it went down with a terrific loss of life. And, and I, I got an SOS, a very short abbreviated one, and I, and, I, and I couldn't identify it. I'm sure it was the Indianapolis, because that's when she went down. We had such a diverse crew, I mean, we had 60-year-olds, and we had 17-year-olds. Uh, because of the Merchant Marine. Yeah. Was there much fraternize? Were you permitted to fraternize with the Japanese? Other than, uh, I know, I see the smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I bought a bar when I was there. Bought a bar? <laughs> this is a good story. <laughs> it was cheaper than drinking. <laughs> Seven or eight hundred dollars. I bought 50% of a bar. We sat at the bar and drank. It was so expensive. By the end of the night, you you spent almost as much as you paid for the bar. I gave it to a lady friend when I realized I wasn't going back. So you don't know. At some point, you may own half a bar somehow in, your, <laughs> in Japan. Someplace, I, somewhere. You that could be your inheritance. The bloom. <laughs> Blue Moon Cafe, I like that place. Most of the people my age and or a little older had their own stories, really. Mm -hmm. They were full of them. The Ar Army boys had their stories, Navy had theirs. And the Mercer Marine, we were still outcasts. The other services did, didn't really cotton to the Mercer Marine. They figured we were overpaid civilians. Mm -hmm. But research had showed that uh, we weren't overpaid. But that wasn't the end of your military career. No, it was on the Diana Panchelet. We got over to Tel Aviv, the port for Israel. And uh, theoretically, we, we brought blankets and clothes and medical supplies and all that sort of stuff. That was what the manifest was supposed to show. And uh, stood out there and watched them open up the hatches and see what's in the holes and so they could start unloading. There were airplanes, bombs, <laughs> weapons, Ammunition. This was on a U.S. U.S. cargo ship. ship. You're on that. And we went to Tel Aviv, Israel, oh. and that's what we were unloading. Wow. Interesting. Had you heard that one before? No. The party line was that the U.S. had nothing to do with it. No, but we caught a few bullets right in the stack. There were bullet holes. John had <laughs> Yeah, he came home from sea once and found his wife had a boyfriend in the in his house, so he burned down his house. <laughs> he never went to jail for it. He says, that's my house. <laughs> I don't know what happened to his wife. <laughs> During World War II, President Roosevelt recognized the fact that they should be equivalent to the other armed services. Mm -hmm. And uh, he even uh, fought for it, passed a law, giving them the same benefits as service people. But that was only World War II veterans. Later ones were, were civilians. And uh, all the time 
that I was in the Merch Marine once I became 18, I was susceptible to the draft. But as long as I kept sailing, they kept deferring me. Mm -hmm. So after the Santa Clara victory laid up, after her uh, munitions ferrying operations, I was vulnerable and I received an invitation that I couldn't refuse. Greetings. <laughs> yes. So I, that's kind of funny, I mean, ironic, that here you had been in the Pacific, you'd been with the Navy, been on ships which had been basically commissioned for the World War II. You were essentially a civilian until the end of, towards the end of the Korea War, and then you were drafted. Right. And guess what they made me in the Army? A high-speed radio operator. <laughs> What did it all mean, do you, th do you think? Well, it's, just, it's a complete different era, and it's a complete new world. Mm -hmm. Very few people are interested anymore, except you. <laughs>